could lean on each other for support in different ways. So there was this hand wringing. Uh, this is where, you know, when we look at something like bowling alone, we realize there's, there's, we got to be concerned about being too nostalgic. Uh, and I'm going to come back to nostalgia in a little bit. Uh, people love to point fingers. So around the same time we started hearing these arguments about how we were growing disconnected from each other, uh, there was a lot of critics who were deriding the selfie. And <laughs> that usually gets it. Any time I even say the word selfie, someone chuckles. Uh, because there is something that's a little embarrassing about it, given all the sort of mainstream articles, titles that we hear about it, conversations that we hear about it. Critics derided it for being narcissistic and self-indulgent. Um, but I would argue that this was a massive misunderstanding of the social media generation. Uh, I remember being in a room, I was doing a sort of think tank with a bunch of di digital producers. This isn't just you know, broadcast producers, but people who created digital content. Uh, and they were all uh, just harping on selfies. This was right after every year, I think there's one of these articles uh, that's about death by selfie, where someone's been on top of a giant building or a mountain and falls off because they're trying to take that image. And, you know, if they go viral, everyone wants to share those stories. Uh, but the thing about digital producers criticizing people for taking uh, selfies is that it breaks rule number one uh, of you know, anyone who has any kind of audience, which is understand what their motivation is, understand why they're doing what they're doing. And in fact, when you dig a little deeper, the sort of second wave of responses to, to selfies, a lot of the a more critical response to it was actually that this was, in some ways, an unprecedented tool for taking control of our own narratives, for telling our own stories. You know, if you have gone through film school, you've studied the male gaze and, you know, sort of the, the, the classic scene to, to explain that would be the shower scene from Psycho. And so here, all of a sudden, people had the ability to tell stories for themselves. Uh, so, um, this the, uh, the, um, the other piece about the, the, the um, selfie critics, especially, was that a lot of them were not so innocent, right? This is where we start seeing how hard it is to change, where we're stuck in our ways. And the example that I like to bring up when I talk about this is the Cannes Film Festival, where right around the same time that they banned the selfie stick, making a big deal about it, they also uh, required that women wear high heels to the festival. So this was an organization that just maybe wasn't necessarily evolving or adapting to the way that they uh, ought to have. What we see from all this is, you know, we often can't see the forest for the trees, or you know, the Marshall McLuhan version of that is that we're a fish in water. Uh, and this is true of people who are criticizing the incredible connective power, revolutionary power of these connective platforms, these digital tools, but also of missing how in parallel there was a handful of companies who were gaining unprecedented power as the platforms by which we were doing all of this. And this is where things start to get complicated. Because, you know, in this way, with this handful of companies that was collecting all of our data through the process of this, it's not that we would fish in water or that person who lost in the forest, we were the frog in the pot. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard, I hate the analogy of the frog in the pot, it's so gruesome, but you know, the story of the frog in the pot is if you put a frog into a pot of boiling water, it'll jump out, it has survival instincts. But if you put a frog in a pot of cold water and slowly warm it to the point that it boils, it won't notice what's happening, right? It happens so gradually that it doesn't see that it's in danger. <laughs> that sort of brings us to now. <laughs> we're on the verge of a dystopia. We're, we're not in a dystopia now, but it feels really close, and it feels like, it sometimes feels like it could happen on the flip of a coin and that we're powerless in it, and that's why it's scary. That's the dystopia piece of all of this, is that it feels sometimes like we don't have control over where things are headed. That we never consented to this new reality, and certainly, if consent is, uh, is, is the terms of service agreements that we we are, are signing up for that nobody reads that are in fine print, like certainly this is not uh, a definition of consent that would hold up in any in any uh, argument. 
The reason this happens is because of the speed of change, right? The reason that this happens is that tech advances exponentially. And that's not human. We don't evolve at an exponential pace. Uh, technology advances faster than humans do, and that means faster than we're prepared to deal with, right? The thing about exponential growth is that the last year cannot prepare us for the next year. The last decade can't prepare us for the next decade. It's not a human pace. Uh, but it's not just technology that has a pace problem or a speed problem. I would say when we're looking at um, uh, when we're talking about speed and pace, it, the problem is it's the predominant uh, business model of this era. You know, you've heard the expression "can it scale?" And when it comes to digital platforms, scaling has been the number one goal, even when scaling too quickly has. Uh, consequences. Enter automation, right? For companies like Amazon and YouTube and Facebook to scale to, to squeal, to scale as quickly as they have, um, they needed to start outsourcing work to algorithms. A lot of crossover between this and the talk this morning in, in a lot of ways, but that reliance on algorithms, what happened is because everything was moving so quickly, no one stepped back to really consider who is creating the algorithms, what those biases might be, what the blind spots were, what happens when there aren't humans involved in decision-making processes. And it's only in hindsight that we're now starting to scramble to answer some of those questions, but again, things move so quickly that we've got double the work to catch up on. Uh, the other thing that happens in parallel with all of this, this unprecedented growth, is that soon social media was no longer just for the early adopters, it was for everybody. And this is not me being the elitist and sort of complaining about mom and dad and grandma being on these platforms. I think all that is, is very good. I think all that's great. Uh, the trouble comes around when everyone is on one of these platforms, we have the network effect. Right? When all of the businesses, all of the services, all of the people you know are on a specific platform, it becomes hard for anybody else or any other company to try and compete. Uh, and this is, um, right, skip to, this is, I, I, this is the trouble. We, we, we start uh, taking on the pace of, of these platforms. Um, this is when things started to shift, right? Once everyone was uh, on these platforms, once they had this sort of unprecedented power, we started seeing uh, the repercussions in, in a number of different ways, in terms of uh, you know, economics, in terms of ethical considerations. Uh, for creators who had ported their followers over, I was having a conversation this morning that was very similar to this, uh, they could no longer access this. That down. And what I mean by this is, you know, when you talk to independent creators or people running nonprofits or even community groups, they may have been on wikis before, they may have had newsletters before, there may have been RSS feeds before, there were different ways that they communicated with those groups. Eventually, they ported everything over to Facebook because Facebook made all these promises. It was easier to use, all the tools were there, that's how you were going to connect with your fans. But we've gotten to the stage now where even if a, 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 an artist, a creator, an entertainer has two million followers, people have opted in to say, I want to be seeing this content. Uh, if something gets posted, it'll be seen by a thousand people unless they start paying upwards of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's this stranglehold, this sort of pay to play that we've seen implemented. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's sort of even on that, I would almost argue on the low level of some of the concerns. The more concerning incidents was where we started seeing algorithms making decisions that ought to have had uh, human input, that arguably, you know, we wouldn't have seen some of these incidents had there been more human involved in these process, uh, processes. Uh, Facebook banned the image of the Nikon girl, not understanding that the, the, the machine, not understanding the historical significance, only seeing a new body. Um, a rape was live streamed, right? This was the beginning, and it feels like weekly there's one of these stories that were coming. Uh, our information was used and was sold. It was sold to people who were going to manipulate us into voting specific ways. And it wasn't that, you know, we were 
self-identifying our political preferences. This was like, do you like Hello Kitty? Do you watch the whole Colbert Report? And do you like pizza? And that being used to identify our uh, sexual orientation, our political orientation, our views on guns, and then being manipulated to vote in specific ways. The thing is, it all happened so fast that even those of us who have been following this, who have been keeping up, felt a little bit wounded by all of it, felt a little bit disoriented by it. Uh, people became anxious and depressed. Uh, it's, you know, there's this constant feeling of FOMO, this feeling of missing out. Uh, so this, reality, this, this perception of reality became warped because you know, everyone was looking at everyone else's insta-perfect lives and while they were home with their bag in the, hands in the bag of chips, not realizing that everybody else was at home with their hands in the bag of chips. These were sort of fabricated realities. And people started getting angry because our shared experiences, that which arguably, especially Web 2.0 was designed to facilitate, uh, started disappearing. Uh, collectively, um, uh, the, the sort of shared experiences as they started disappearing, there was three uh, phases of this. First, it was the notion of the filter bubble, right? That we get our information from our social networks, from the people who think like us, and act like us, and vote like us, and have similar backgrounds as us. Uh, that's then when algorithms started feeding into that, and we were each getting personalized news feeds. So everything that we're, we were seeing was targeted to our opinions and our ideals. Uh, and then the next phase of that, which I would say is arguably when we reach the tipping point, is that information no longer even needed to be real. It just needed to be what people wanted to see and what people wanted to believe. And at that point, um, with everyone in their own echo chambers, something else happened, which is that the same platforms that enabled diverse creators and niche groups to reach audiences also fostered angry, angry and dangerous extremist groups. And for the first time since it became unacceptable to burn a cross on someone's lawn, hate had a place to congregate. So that could be the end of my talk. Uh, but it's not. It's not the end of this talk. Uh, because I'm an optimist. And this, you know, at full disclosure, I will say I am a, a cautious optimist. Um, but I am defiant in my belief that we can bring about change. I, I don't think we're, as I mentioned, I don't think that we're in the dystopia yet, but it does feel like at the flip of a coin we could be there. Uh, thing to remember, and the piece of this that gives me hope is that we are the engine. The thing about uh, social media is that we are the engine that draw, drives it. And this is true of really the entire internet, right? We make it and populate it. We are the content and the product and the user. It's easy to forget that you know, these companies aren't content companies. Now, granted, this is the same argument that they have used for years and years and years. We're just platforms. We're not responsible for the content that gets posted here. But all of a sudden, if we can hold them accountable to what they use as an excuse for being accountable all this time, we have more power than we think we do. Uh, as the content creators and the users and both sides of this equation, uh, we do have a way forward in all of this. We have more control than we think. And there, I would argue there is no tech solution for where we find ourselves right now. There are only human solutions. Uh, the options. Um, in terms of escaping this dystopia. Uh, I'd say the first step is in regaining control of our attention or our data. And then once we regain control of our data, we're regaining control of our attention. Or actually, I guess that's, I guess that's flipped. I guess the first thing that we need to do is be regaining control of our attention. And from there, uh, be regaining control of our data. Now, I mentioned nostalgia is a funny thing. You know, we talk about, uh, um, the, the, we, tend to look, we tend to look at history with rose-colored glasses. And as much as it is important to sort of rein in the overreach of these big tech companies, it's also important to remember that uh, internet freedoms globally are on the decline. And surveillance and big data is being used to uh, surveil and control populations around the world. So there's a balance that we need to consider in all of this. 
when we do look backwards, when we are overly nostalgic to the way things were back when we were, you know, all connected and bowling together and everyone was, you know, social in these ways that we feel like we aren't now, uh, we tend to forget the details. We gloss over things. And the concerning thing is we also forget the lessons we've learned. We forget some of the hardships that we've been through. Uh, the reality is the world is connected. There's no going back. Uh, and really, this argument of pushing back against big tech, important as it is, we need to remember it is a privileged position to be in. Uh, now, the thing is, uh, people are afraid of change, right? Change is scary. Change is hard. This is, you know, whenever we hear about change, people, someone in the room will bring up the notion of the singularity and that horizon that we can't see past. And there's nothing scarier, I think, to humans than not being able to envision something, not knowing, not being able to answer. And that's the whole notion of uh, the, the singularity, that horizon line, is not being able to see past a certain point. There's really interesting uh, work that's been done that talks about uh, people who make um, small changes towards environmental sustainability for their families, right? Changing what kind of light bulbs they use. And they'll do it for their children, and they'll, they'll do it for their grandchildren. But once you get a couple generations down, it's so, uh, it's so, so, it's, it's so transparent, it's so hard to envision uh, that they, they, they can't adjust their behavior for it. And so this is what happens when we're looking too far out, is we get scared. This is where, you know, we hear these, um, the, the sort of rhetoric of us working for the robot overlords. Now, uh, <laughs> The thing is, uh, that notion of the singularity happens right around the time probably my daughter, who's a year and a half now, would be in university. And the flip side of some of those, of those uh, sort of scarier headlines about change is that, well, it's also true. You know, the World Economic Forum says that for kids who are entering grade school today, 65% of them will be working in jobs that don't currently exist. Uh, so for someone who's one, I imagine, you know, that's probably closer to 85 or 90, right? Change is happening. This is, the, this is the reality of the world that we're living in. And so things that never really needed an explanation before suddenly need re-explaining. You know, I think we need to come to terms with the status quo and not sort of rely on nostalgia because nostalgia will lead us astray. We won't be able to solve problems. We won't recognize the way things have changed for good, all the good that's happening. And it's only by really understanding how things have already changed that we can prepare for the change that is to come. So based on you know a decade or a decade and a half of observing and writing about um, all of these topics, here's sort of the big uh, structural social pillars that I think need a bit of redefining. Uh, the first is power. Uh, power, I would say, when we talk about power, these days we're talking about information. There's a, there was a story about 10 years ago uh, that I heard in one of my interviews that was fascinating. There was a CEO of an insurance company who said that he only bought uh, food, food, fast food with cash. And if you project to this year, right, this year we found out that John Hancock is now only going to provide insurance policies to people who use the equivalent of a Fitbit. Now, that might seem like, a, you know, there, there's people who are going to opt into that thinking, well, I'm really healthy and, and I get better premiums because I walk X amount of steps every day. That seems like a good thing. But what does that CEO know? Right? Why wasn't he using a credit card at McDonald's? Because if they can give you a lower premium for using your Fitbit, what happens when they don't cover you? Because six months ago, you got a Big Mac on your visa, right? Information is power. Uh, tied to that is this notion of currency. And currency, I would say these days, is data. Uh, we are told, right? I wrote an article a while back talking about data being the new oil. And we were told that we're living in a, an, an attention economy and that it's eyeballs and clicks that generate revenue. But it's not. Everybody at this stage is getting quite familiar with the reality that it's the, the um, the cumulative of all of those clicks and eyeballs. It's the data that's generated that then ends up becoming pennies in people's bank accounts. The trouble is, it's our data that is not our bank accounts, right? Anything that's free is not free. We are the product. And this is where we start hearing more and more enthusiasm around the notion of decentralization, challenging as it may be. Uh, tied to this notion of currency and data is what has value. And you know, arguably, even though data has cash value, if we measure uh, value by scarcity and abundance, 
Um, what's really valuable right now is trust. And you know, I think talk to anyone who's within you know ten miles of working in journalism, and they will you know talk to you for hours or days about this. Uh, we don't have enough of the truth right now, and that means it's incredibly valuable and incredibly uh, necessary, incredibly needed. There are major major financial institutions right now that are. Um, uh, hiring, they're stealing away journalists from major papers because they want to. They want them telling their own stories in a way that's not an ad, that's not an advertorial. Realizing that trust is at an all-time low, and so how do we start rebuilding that among these communities? You know, for people who are working in in these spaces, for people who are doing anything that remotely looks like selling, even if it is trying to convey your ideas to an audience that you want hearing it, there needs to be a value exchange. There needs to be ways in which you are establishing trust with the people that you're working with. Uh, the other thing that I think is really shifted is this notion of who's in charge. Uh, I know there's an op-ed, thank you for sharing it with me this morning, in the New York Times talking about the need to uh, break up the control of Facebook. The question there is, is it the big tech companies that are in charge? Maybe, you know, they certainly never want to say they're in charge. Every time things go wrong, they say, I don't know what they're doing, and they're flying by the seat of their pants. Uh, is it their board? I think, you know, that's certainly, I think, where we can put more attention than we ever do, is at the boards of these big companies. Uh, government? Absolutely. I mean, this is really one of the big necessities. This is one of the, one of the major areas of promotion we're going to see in the next few years is government regulation, is the need for antitrust, uh, and new laws to break up some of these monoliths. You know, the challenge when we are in rooms like this where everyone is, is uh, informed on these topics, or even, you know, our own, uh, you know, I look at my sort of echo chamber of who I follow on Twitter, which is journalists and researchers. Uh, it's not necessarily giving us an accurate representation of, of how people consume and use these platforms. I can't tell you how, it is weekly that I hear from people that they're leaving Facebook and moving to Instagram. What's up? Right, there is this, this opaqueness that surrounds these companies that's challenging and dangerous. Uh, we, I still would argue, this is where my optimism comes, I still would argue that we are in charge. We're just not, uh, we're not mobilizing our, our, our power at this stage. And again, going back to this notion that power is tied to information, if people are thinking that leaving Facebook for Instagram is a power move or is uh, you know, sort of a pushback against the man, we've got challenges in the way of the dissemination of information. And that's why power is not sitting with people at this moment. The second that people become more informed, we start seeing possibly room for, for, for some movement on all of this. Uh, borders is another uh, interesting area of change. Because again, these big tech companies are bigger, wealthier than countries. Now, the GDPR is a really interesting example of how borders start changing. You know, here's regulation that started off in Europe, and yet a lot of us over here, over on this side of the pond, will benefit from those rules because it's easier in a lot of cases to make one size fit all changes as opposed to making changes that just apply to European citizens. The challenge is that's equally applicable when you've got authoritarian governments who are cracking down on content and changes get made to these platforms to make them happy as well. So we do need to be concerned about the sort of border borderless um, reality and what that means when we're trying to deal with these companies. Uh, skills is an interesting one, and certainly you know I run an incubator uh, for innovation and creative industries, and skills is something we're always talking about. Um, and you know, certainly it's been fascinating. I think for the last 10 years, there was such a push towards STEM and engineering and everyone becoming uh, a coder so that we could either be the caretakers or creators of our uh, robot companions, our robot coworkers. Now we're seeing the emergence of you know, those innately human skills of communication and critical problem solving and creativity. Uh, if anything, though, I think some of the real, uh, some, of, some of the real necessity, especially you know, when you're looking at job applicants is uh, focus and clarity, is being able to cut through the noise, is there is so much information, there is so much misinformation, and it all goes by so quickly, we're dealing with this uh, crisis of speed in a sense, uh, that uh, it's really focus and clarity that I think top the list as well, no matter what discipline people are entering into. 
I touched on speed. I, uh, I, I'm always giving spoilers away from my next slide, but this is the last slide I'm going to leave you with. Uh, and in some ways, I think this is the most important one. We all need to slow down. It is 100% my belief, though, when we start slowing down a little bit, uh, it will help. Uh, there's you know, this notion of, of synchronicity versus asynchronicity. And once upon a time when uh, you know, someone called you, you were interrupted from whatever task it was that you were working on to take their call. And so it was this great relief when all of a sudden we had dial up internet and if you wanted to communicate with someone on the other side of the planet, instead of them needing to either wake you in the middle of the night or interrupt you while you were working, they could email you when you were ready and in between tasks, you could uh, communicate with them. The challenge is all of a sudden, uh, the internet got a lot faster, and we got these devices with push notifications, and that original problem, which was that we would get dis uh, interrupted and distracted every time someone wanted to reach us, was magnified by you know, millions of percent. So uh, our, the, the pace that, you know, I, I spoke earlier about this sort of pace of change and the pace of our timelines, and we are at a stage now where, you know, to it, it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't, we shouldn't have any questions about how misinformation spreads. If we've got timelines that move faster than uh, we can keep up with, there's no way people can read articles and retweet those articles or like them or post something pithy about them as those timelines are moving by. So what we have is an era in which, you know, six out of ten people are posting things without having read them. It's a crisis of misinformation, of lack of information. And if we slow down, we start solving some of these problems. Instead of trying to keep up with the pace of our uh, timelines, we start working on having our technology keep pace with us. Uh, this, is how, you know, this is how fake news spreads, uh, is we're sharing things without reading things. Uh, and this goes back to this notion and uh, the sort of problematic notion of move fast and break things. Because again, as I stated at the beginning, there's a lot of things that are broken, right? The company who used this as their welcome to the world slogan is, is, is breaking a lot of you know, essential components of our civilization. So maybe it's time to stop moving quite so fast. Uh, what happens when we slow down is we regain control of our attention. And when we regain control of our attention, we have the power to regain control of our data. And this is where we have the ability to change the current uh, narrative arc. The other thing about slowing down is that it buys us a little bit of time, right? We are not in a dystopia yet, but we are very close. And if we keep hurtling forward at this breakneck pace that's not human, but driven by tech, and driven by this obsession with scaling, that's how we tumble into this abyss before we have the ability to alter course. But if we slow down a little bit, this is where we can, you know, we're all right. We've got the skill set. We just need to give ourselves the breathing room to be able to implement it. Uh, so I'll leave it on that. Thank you.